Hi, we've seen that tit for tat is a highly successful strategy for dealing with iterated prisoner's dilemmas. But it does have some problems, and I want to talk about some of those problems, look at a variant that tries to fix those problems, and then also look at a strategy that, perhaps surprisingly, manages consistently to beat tit for tat. We've seen a strategy already that comes very close to it and sometimes defeats it, namely the Pavlov strategy. It's actually very similar to tit for tat in a lot of ways. But there are strategies, well, really a combination of strategies, that can beat tit for tat. And there's a nice example of how that might be done, though it is only going to work in a certain limited range of cases. First, problems with tit for tat. What kinds of issues arise? What makes it less in some settings effective than some other strategies. The first problem is that power relations sometimes make retaliation impossible. So let's say you're in a hierarchy and it's your boss that is actually consistently defecting. I once worked for a boss like that. I put up with it for about two years and I quit that job. And the reason was that I constantly felt that my boss was stabbing me in the back. There was nothing I could do about that. With a peer, if they defect, you can retaliate, you can respond by defecting. But what do, you, what do you do if your boss defects and stabs you in the back? There can be often very little you can do to retaliate against somebody higher in the hierarchy. And so that creates a problem. The same thing can arise in all sorts of other kind of power relationships with people in positions of authority. They can do various things to you and you're not really in a position to retaliate. In those settings, it really starts looking like bully and victim rather than like two people mutually seeking cooperation. And so even if it turns out for the person higher above, it would be better for them if you cooperated. It's going to be very difficult for you to do anything else given the difference in power. What about other settings, friendship or love, where there's a consistent relationship that you don't wanna mess up by retaliating. And if you get this sense that it's always this for that, you're really losing the kind of sense of cooperation of being in this together, of communal sharing, to use the term from relationship regulation theory, that we think is really vital to those relationships. I remember a neighbor who was divorced and was dating some guy, and she complained about precisely this. Of course, she didn't know game theory, she didn't put it in those terms. But what it amounted to is that if he called and said, hey, want to have dinner Friday night? And she said, no, I'm busy, I can't do it Friday night. Then the next time she suggested something, she said, hey, you want to go to that festival on Saturday? They, no, I'm busy. It was always that kind of retaliation. You say no to me, well, then I'm going to say no to you ne next time and so on. And in the end, it destroyed that relationship because she thought, wait a minute, <laughs> this is a weird kind of, you know, I have to do this to get my reward. I have to do that. It, it was incompatible with the kind of sharing that ought to take place within a romantic relationship. But I don't think it's just romance. It can happen within friendships. It can happen with productive coworker relationships and all sorts of other things. Here's another problem. It's easy to get into cycles, cycles of retaliation. And that can sometimes happen due to miscommunication or misperception. I may think that a person has defected when in fact they haven't. I may misread their behavior. And in a setting like that, I then retaliate but they're taken aback. They didn't defect first in their opinion. They didn't see what they did as any kind of defection. And so they're upset and they, I think they betrayed me. They think I betrayed them. And in short, we get into this cycle of retaliation that can destroy the friendship, destroy the working relationship without actually either one of us in thinking we're initiating this problem. So there is a serious problem of misperception in ordinary human communication. Can we always recognize cooperation and defection? Sometimes we may be inaccurate in our perception. We may misread cooperation as defection. Or conversely, we may misread defection as cooperation. The person is pretending to cooperate while not really cooperating. We may have no idea. And so these mistakes can echo back and forth in the relationship. There's no way to end the cycle. And that's a problem. We've talked about the importance of forgiveness. Well, tit for tat is in a way not that forgiving. I retaliate, but then the other player playing tit for tat retaliates against my retaliation. Then I retaliate against their retaliation against my retaliation and so on.
Here is a way of trying to repair these. This is put forward by Dixit and Nalabuf in their book, Thinking Strategically. Start by cooperating, just as with tit for tat, and cooperate until the level of apparent defection becomes unacceptable. Then refer to tit for tat. Now, this is a vague sort of repair. It's very close to tit for n tats, for example, except that requires that the defections all occur in a row. You might think there's a certain total number of defections you want to tolerate, or a certain percentage of defection. It might be, hey, cooperate unless the ratio of defections to cooperations ends up being some, at least unprovoked defections, ends up being over 10% or over 20% or something like that. And then you have a cutoff, you say no more. So there are different ways of pursuing this general idea. It might be the number of defections, the number of defections in a row, the ratio of cooperations to defections. We might identify this in a variety of ways. But in short, we keep cooperating, we keep forgiving any defections up to a certain point. And then we say, okay, enough. But unlike some strategies that say, enough, I'm done with you, I defect from now on, this simply says, now I play tit for tat. Now I retaliate against every defection. Until now I've been forgiving, but that's it. No more forgiveness. So here's an example of how that might play out. We've seen tit for tat playing Joss, where there's a random defection, and notice it does set up this cycle of defections. But what happens if we instead have a misinterpretation? It has exactly the same effect. This person cooperates, but then instead of a random defection here from tit for tat, it thinks, it misreads this, it thinks there's been a defection. And so we get exactly the same pattern. But in this case, there was no intentional defection. There was a misinterpretation that made us think that a, an action that was actually cooperative was really a defection. It sets up the same destructive cycle. Now, how could we get out of this? Well, suppose we say, I'm going to cooperate until the level of defections becomes intolerable. Then, instead of defecting here and setting up the cycle, we cooperate. We say, I forgive you. Okay, we've been cooperating. Now, what looks to me like a defection, maybe I'm misinterpreting this, maybe this is a one-time lapse, I forgive you. And in short, what happens then is that the pattern of, of cooperation continues until there is a defection or until there's another misinterpretation. So it solves that problem, at least up to a certain point. That does point to a serious problem with tit for tat. When you get into those cycles, of destruction, of mutual retaliation, there is no way out. Here is a picture of the Hatfields and McCoys involved in a classic case of that kind of mutual retaliation. Well, I've said that it is possible to beat tit for tat and to beat Pavlov. How do you do it? You use what is known as the Southampton strategy, but it requires the cooperation of another player who is your partner. And so the two of you have to work together to do it. How does that happen? It's illustrated in the movie Talladega Nights. Okay, it is the shake and bake strategy of Ricky Bobby. And so here's how it goes. You recognize your partner and then one always cooperates <laughs> and one always defects. The result is that the player who cooperates loses badly, but the player who defects against that partner wins. Now, of course, that only works when they're playing against one another. When they're playing against other people, they simply use tit for tat or Pavlov, or in short, do a productive strategy. But when you recognize your partner, you realize, oh, in interactions with you, my role is to cooperate. I go belly up. And the other person says, aha, I recognize now what I do is defect. And here's the idea. You might think, well, yeah, great for the person who is Ricky Bobby, not so great for his partner who is constantly cooperating. He never gets to win. And so you might think, well, uh, yeah, okay, great. One of them wins, but the other loses big. However, it's not quite that simple. The winner can turn around and share the victory with a partner. And so often it's set up in such a way that the payoff for this person is high enough that even if they share it with this person enough to make it a benefit to them, they're still better off. The group, in other words, the two of them, the pair, are better off, not just that player. Well, that's a fascinating strategy. It does require one person to consistently come in second place in those interactions, to consistently lose in those interactions, the other player 
to recognize here I've got the willing victim, I can consistently win in those interactions.